Good evening. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I am Kat. I am your host here on Fate Mag Radio. Due to an unexpected and totally weird technical error, I am not able to rebroadcast or to broadcast my interview with Philip Mantle. And I know you're disappointed. He is absolutely one of the best people I've had a chance to speak with. He is so knowledgeable about ufology. He has flying disc press. I was very excited to be able to present the information about that. Hopefully, I will be able to do that soon. So, in lieu of having Philip, I have decided to rebroadcast the last interview that I did with Jennifer and Kevin Malick. Jennifer is a psychic demonologist. She is a remote viewer. She works with Project Psy, and they have brought home over 100 children who were taken. So I am just so thrilled with her about that. Kevin, as you may know, passed away fairly recently. He was one of the smartest people I've ever known. He was definitely a paralegion, as is Jennifer. They founded the North Northern Wisconsin Paranormal Society Limited and have done fantastic things. Kevin is actually who brought me into the more anomalous topics. He was a brilliant conspiracy theorist. I can only imagine what he would be doing right now. So I just can't even tell you what great people these are. And so I hope that you enjoyed this show. I know it's not Philip Mantle, but sometimes things happen. And every time they do, I always assume that there's a reason for it. I I don't know what it is. Not all the time, but I think it's really pretty cool. So let's get on and we will enjoy this show with the most brilliant people I know. One of whom I miss very much and the other who I carry in my heart because I know how bad she hurts. So let's enjoy this. They're brilliant. Good evening. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. Please note that the opinions voiced by our guests do not necessarily reflect the opinions of this network nor our sponsors. Enjoy the shows. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting. The best in paranormal talk radio reaching all the way back to 1948 fate magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown all of them true Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition. Here is your host of Fate Radio, Kat Hobson. Good evening. Welcome to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. You are listening to Fate Mag Radio, the online voice of Fate Magazine. I am Kat Hobson, your host, and I am so pleased to welcome you. I have to tell you that tonight's program is going to be absolutely fascinating. Not because of me, but because of my guests. I am fortunate enough to have a married couple join me tonight who are very, very well-read, well-educated, well-respected, and well-known in the field of just about all things anomalous. Jennifer Malik is a psychic demonologist and a psychic remote viewer with Project Psy. She's an investigator with the Northern Wisconsin Paranormal Society Limited. Kevin Malik is a paranormal historian. He is a ufologist, formerly a field investigator with MUFON. He is an esoteric and conspiracy analyst. 
He is a radio host, they both are, here on this network with Paraversal Universe Radio. He is the founder of the Northern Wisconsin Paranormal Society Limited. He also is a gifted artist, as you will see when you go to his Facebook page, Paraversal, <clears throat> excuse me, Paraversal, I have just lost my mind, I can't find it. Paraversal Universe Paratunes. I am so sorry, y'all, but you've got to check this out. He also is, they also put together a show that broadcasts on their show once a month, sometimes a little more, called the Paralegion Report, which is a panel of paralegions who have discussions on things that have caught their eye in the news media. They also are Lake Monstrosities on Facebook. That is all things aquatic and marine that are anomalous. They are also Ultimate Conspiracies on Facebook. Find that great because there's some interesting stuff there. The Northern Wisconsin Paranormal Society Limited is their group and it is a 501c3 organization they are absolutely brilliant researchers they write for supernatural magazine and please help me welcome jennifer and kevin malik hi malix hello hi cat how you doing i'm well how are you i'm sorry i stumbled on the cartoon page i love oh. the cartoon page i should say that i didn't draw them all them cartoons on there I draw I maybe one percent of right. them, like just one percent. What they are is a collection of uh, just paranormal cartoons from from all the different fields, and uh, that Jennifer and myself collect. And every time we come across one, we put it on the page. It's been really good for for us for uh, you know uh, advertising the show, and and just for sharing funny cartoons with people. Well, they're great. The ones that yeah. you select are absolutely fantastic. I love it. I can get lost on that page. <laughs> it's, actually, uh, it's funny because we have uh, 10 plus like pages. Uh, and that page is, uh, is right now has got more likes than any other page. That's because it's excellent. They all are. In all fairness, they all are. But I just love, I mean, it's such a novel concept. To me, it was a no. <laughs> I know, right? I mean, because yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, I know that there are individual uh, cartoonists that specialize in uh, paranormal cartoons, but uh, I don't. I, I can't think of any page that collects them from all artists, you know, into one spot. So, you know, uh, yeah, it's cool. People like oh. it. Well, it's obvious mm. that, <laughs> pardon me, you know, yeah. we have known each other for about five years, and right. I am so glad that y'all are on this network. How on earth, A, how did you get started with Paraversal Universe, but if, after you educate people about yourselves a little bit with that, I'd like to know how both of you got into the paranormal field and especially delving into the ufology. Kevin, I remember when you were getting your um, MUFON training as well as the conspiracy because conspiracy analysis is a lot of work because you have to be dotting I's and crossing T's and not get fooled and recognize disinformation. So, which of you would care to go first? Ladies first? Okay. Yeah, come on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I got started in the paranormal. Um, I come from a family of gifted females. And growing up, I was always able to hear and see spirits. And for me back then, it was normal. Because when I would see them growing up, I would see them as 
flesh and blood, like they were physically here. And I would often think that they may be, maybe they were family members I haven't met. Maybe they were friends of the family. Maybe they were neighbors. Um, it is one particular spirit that was in the home, uh, and she had two children with her. So there was actually three. Sorry about that. And I would see her all the time. And I would never think anything of it because we've had, we, we would normally have people that we knew coming in and out of the house on a daily basis. And so I got curious one day and cause I would see her all the time and I got home from school this one day and my parents were sitting at their, their kit, at the kitchen room table and she was standing in between them. And so I seen her and I asked who the lady was. And my parents kind of looked at each other and they looked at me and they're like, what lady? And I'm thinking, okay, you know, haha, very funny. You're pulling my chain kind of a thing. And my mom was like, can you describe this lady to me? So I was able to describe her in great detail from what she looked like to what she was wearing. And they both kind of shot each other this look like, uh oh, you know, like just surprise. And they told me not too long after that the house was built in like the 1800s and that she had actually passed away in that home. And that's why I'd been seeing the whole entire time. That was one of my first experiences with the spirit world. Um, I got more into it by reading books, uh, going to the library, watching TV shows, going to forums, because I just, I, I got curious. I wanted to know more. And, you know, like I said, I had a great support system. And so for me, that's how I really got started in the paranormal. Um, I would say with demonology, because also with my abilities, I would see those things too when I was really young. Which is uh, frightening. It's very frightening. Uh, one of the entities that I remember seeing, and I saw a couple of times actually, was the hat man. And I've seen some other other things that scared me. Um, and I was Did you say a, Batman? No, hat man. Hat man. Okay, I'm sorry. I was yeah. like, okay. Thank you for clarifying that. You're welcome. And so I would see stuff like this, like I said, growing up. And I was living in Florida before I had actually met Kevin. And I used to do medium walks of homes for people that requested me. And I got called out to do this one particular home where I did a medium walk. And I was attacked by something demonic. Oh, my word. And the people, it turns out, I found out later on, that the people that were inviting people like myself and others into the house were pretty much Satanists and were and had summoned something into the home and they would bait people to come into the home to see if anything would happen to them. How did you and cope? It scared the crowd out of me. Um, when I got there, I knew there was something there that was just dark and not natural. Um, I wanted to wait until I conducted the house walk, uh, so I could speak to the people that invited me on behalf of the owners to come in and explain to them what I was picking up. And so it was a two level home and I walked the whole entire first floor, didn't pick up on anything, decided I was going to go upstairs and start walking, you know, doing the walking, doing my walk on the second floor. I get, now the steps, the way the steps were is you went straight up a couple of steps and then they turned on an angle and then it was more steps. I had gotten up to the set of steps on the landing that would have taken me up to where the hallway were, where the hallway was. And at the same, same time I put my hand on the banister, I felt a cold blast of air. I looked up and I see in this seven, to, seven foot tall black mass. And I was frozen to the banister. I, I couldn't speak. I couldn't move because I certainly wasn't expecting that. Exactly. And about the time that I was registering what it was I was seeing, 
this thing rushed at me. I got picked up from where I was standing and thrown across the room and I smacked right up against the wall. I had help getting up and I look up at this time and the homeowners are laughing. Oh my gosh. Laughing. So I had to have help. They, they helped me get home. Um, cause I screwed up my ankle. Thankfully it wasn't a break. Got to the front door and I said, not so nice words. I said, you don't need help. I said, you guys don't need people coming to check out your house. You need Jesus. True. And left the home. So shortly after that, I started noticing little black shadows in my house during the day and even during the night. And this went on for a good while. It got to the point where it was day or night. I would be standing someplace or sitting someplace. I would get pinned to furniture. I would get scratched. Um, I would get bruises. And it just, I got so fed up with it. It didn't scare me so much. It's just, it irritated me. And I wanted it gone. So I called a priest from a local Catholic church and I explained to him what was going on. And he said he would come out the next day and do a minor right, which is uh, nothing short of just like a house blessing. And the night before he came, after I got off the phone with him, I had gone to take a shower before I went to bed. And this thing made an appearance and I got pinned up against the shower wall and I got the snot smacked out of me. And oh, I think what creeped me out in that moment was because I wear St. Michael's medals and St. Benedict medals and they're blessed. Mm-hmm. I had them on. You a had ribbon. them on? I had them on. I heard a clink and saw that the, that the medals had fallen off the ribbon and they were completely intact. The ribbon was still around my neck. Wow. And so I, called, right, so I called, I called the priest back and I explained to him what happened and he came out and he did what I said and he got rid of it. I didn't have any more problems. So instead of just scaring me, I wanted to know more about these things and help be, and help people with these kind of attachments or these these entities because nobody should have to go through any anything that's demonic. Can I just say really quick, just, just for people listening, that um, not all house blessings are uh, minor rights or, or home deliverances. Right. But all home deliverances have blessings, yes. house blessings. Just to make that, just to clarify that, because you had right, right. I did actually find out too that they had children that were not present at the home at the time, and child services stepped in, I guess, through the church because they had apparently been bragging to the neighbors that they were Satanists and that when their kids were born, they attached demons to their children. And what his got taken away? Yep. Holy, holy yeah. wow, yeah. Well, that's what should have happened in that instance. So that's what, you know, and that just for me study and that just propelled me further into the, to, to the work and helping people out. And then I picked up a couple of years ago, a friend of ours and mentor who just passed away. May he rest in peace. Um, I learned a lot from him during my demonology studies too. And it just made me grow to be more of the person that I am now. Well, and that's quite a person. And he was too. And, oh, he... and prayers for their family as well. And for people like you who loved him. Thank you. Yeah, he was amazing. He was He was a true warrior of God. And so now, <coughs> pardon me. You also, um, aside from the demonology work, you are a psychic reader who works with Project Psy, and you save missing children. Yes, I do. Um, I've been with Project PSI and, and Dr. Kennedy for a year. And to date, we've brought home 54 missing children and solved nine cold case murders. That's the incident numbers. Yeah, 
Right. And not your number. No, that's the Institute number. Okay. That's the Institute's numbers. And I love doing this work. I yeah. absolutely love doing it. It's a beautiful thing. I mean, truly. And I want to thank you because I have had someone remote view through me. I didn't care for that. <laughs> it's very disconcerting. But the fact that you can do this and actually affect human lives is just, to me, that's a beautiful thing. So, and you're getting kudos in chat, and <laughs> you should, because, you know, <clears throat> you put yourself out there when you do this. Do you see through the victim's eyes or through the perpetrator's eyes? It depends. I've actually seen, um, I've actually seen through both. I've actually felt the emotions of the perpetrator and the victims uh, to the point where I have actually talked to Doc during cases um, that he gives us that there have been instances where I would, where I'm remote, where I'm viewing a case remotely or a person remotely, whether it's a victim or a perp. And I would get stuff to where I would actually physically get head pains or I would get that coppery taste in my mouth like I was tasting blood. Mm -hmm. And it would be one of those things where when it first started happening, I wanted to make sure that it wasn't me. Because, you know, sometimes you hear you were instances where you accidentally bite your tongue or, right. you know, what yes. I mean? so stuff like that. And I, I always do a health check on me before I do this kind of work. Because it's it's very it's very worth it and it's very taxing energy wise, but when it comes totally. to that, I would describe this stuff when I would talk to to Dr. Kennedy and I'm like, because just by looking at the photo, I would be able to tell whether the victim I was looking for was alive or deceased, and the same thing goes for a perpetrator. Can I explain to everybody how this Project Psy works? Well, you can when we come back from our break. Okay. Because we are already up against a break. I am just astonished always. But we'll be back with the Maleks right after this. Y'all come back to you. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. U.S. presidents are on record talking about the UFO mystery. Yep. Presidents Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan, both had UFO sightings of their own, but the current presidential campaign might be the first in which UFO disclosure has been championed by a major party candidate. DIA, CIA, it moves around, is operating a program to train psychic spies to spy and use their powers against Russia. John Ronson writes about this in The Men Who Stare at Goats. The first known sighting of a ghost took place right after Abraham Lincoln was assassinated uh, in the late 1860s during the administration of Ulysses Grant. Project Paperclip, Clinton releases it all in 1998. Possibly the unequal cooling of its surface. I say, do you still think it's a meteor, Professor? I don't know what to think. The uh, metal casing is definitely extraterrestrial. It's a place where UFO hunters and scientists gather to examine paranormal activity in the region. Some of the documents, this is bringing Nazi scientists into the United States to work here. So we fought against the Nazis. And it's not, this again is not a revelation. As early as 1947, 1946, we knew some of this, right? On the paranormal, will we see U.S. President Barack Obama's foreign policy go intergalactic in a quest for gold stolen by aliens? We'll tell you at least how the White House responded to claims the chief executive has been teleporting to Mars. But let's get to today's capital account. 
UFOs, hauntings, psychic abilities, conspiracy, ESP, cryptozoology. There are many things that remain unexplained in the inexplicable world around us. And we're talking about them here, looking for answers on WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. The truth is out there. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 23 minutes after the hour. Welcome back to Fate Mag Radio here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I am Kat Hobson, your host, and I am fortunate enough to be joined by my guests, Jennifer and Kevin Malik of the North, Northern Wisconsin Paranormal Society Limited, a 501c3 corporation. And guys, thank you so much. You actually... Kevin had wanted to interject with a, a description and explanation of Project Psy relevant to Jennifer's experience with them. Would you please do that? Sure. <clears throat> so, excuse me there. With Project Psy, the Project PSI Institute, uh, so Dr. Chuck Kennedy is a neuroscientist. He's got a PhD in neuroscience. And uh, He's also been doing work in parapsychology since the late 60s, uh, a, a very well-versed and well-rounded paranormal professional um, and, you know, uh, medical professional as well, of course. So he founded this, this, this PSI Institute, and it was to uh, study psychic abilities, scientifically speaking. And through the process of doing this, um, over the years, he had met uh, various psychics who he had worked with, and he had mapped out their brains and and uh, you know whatnot. And he decided one day that you know, hey, I know some of the best psychics in the world. If I can get a handful of them together, I wonder if we can bring home a missing child. So uh, he came up with uh, uh, a way that applies scientific method to analyzing the data that remote viewers get. So as it stands today, he has 12 psychics that work at PSI from spread out across North America. The psychics don't talk to each other about the cases they work. What he does is he will send each psychic a, a picture coordinates and a paragraph about their last moment or or any you know relevant information as far as like uh just general information you know they uh and what they do then is they remote view it the, the case they'll meditate and and do their thing and then they give uh he talks to them one-on-one -on -one and they give him all their impressions and he enters the impressions into this computer matrix. The computer matrix looks for commonalities. So what he's able to do, because no psychic is 100% right all the time. True. People, people make mistakes and whatnot, and he had to uh, allow for this and be able to you know, uh, deal with it. And, and this is how he decided he was going to deal with it. So what he does, because he works with law enforcement and he works with like everything from the FBI down to local police. Uh, when he has psychics that are picking up on the same thing and the matrix tells him, like, for instance, uh, red barn on the edge of town, okay? Five of my 12 psychics mentioned a, a red house or a red barn on the edge of town. That's, okay, so he'll tell them that, like, you know, uh, this is something that you should look into, it, it may be relevant. In that particular case, it was relevant. Uh, I think it was a sheriff went out there with with a bunch of men, and not only did they find the missing person, but they found like 
Then they found like a basement what full it, of them or what, something. What it was was this particular red barn was used for traffickers, and they would oh my goodness they would have their their victims there until they could get buyers or move them. And this particular instance, it was twelve to fifteen girls, and they were all described as being in the corner of this particular big red barn um, with shackles attached to their ankles. And so they go in, they, they listen to them, they go in, and they find all these girls the exact same way that it was described. The outside area looked like they described the inside right down to the number of girls. And so for that instance, 12 to 15 or 16 girls were saved from being trafficked. Well, you know, that is something that is outstanding. I'm actually stunned by that. I did not know of that case. That's an awful lot of people to save at one time. Yeah, he just came out with a book uh, about some of the stuff they're doing at the Institute. And, again, this is scientific stuff. This is academic research. Yeah. You know, this is uh, – the book is called The Power of PSI or PSI. By yes. Dr. Charney. So, and, uh, yeah, so I just wanted to explain that to the people. So, and Jennifer happens to be one of the 12 psychics that work with Dr. Chuck. Yeah. So. Yeah, because um, he, he deals with the families and the law enforcement. We don't. Right. So the team finds yeah. the the kids. It's not any individual per se. Yeah. We don't even, and as far as, you know, the rest of the, the team that I work with, we don't talk about the case. We don't look it up on the news. We don't talk to each other. The only person that we go th- we go to with our information is Dr. Kennedy. Well, I was curious about that because I know that a lot of law enforcement will not openly work with psychics. It's about although... half and half. They've done, there's actually been, uh, they've looked at that. And uh, there was two different uh surveys done and it, was, and it basically comes down to half of people in law enforcement are open to the idea of pursuing psychic information if it's deemed that uh you know uh, the psychic is is credible or onto something and half uh don't want to use them at all just feel that it's 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 not needed or acceptable well, i think the barn incident would probably indicate that it doesn't hurt Oh, for sure. Right. I, mean, I mean, seriously. I would think that most of the people listening to the show are free thinkers. And, and, and yes. you know, like if you can even save one person, do it. Yeah. I mean, come on. I'm with right? that. So, I'm yeah. coming down on that side of that conversation. And, Jennifer, we have a question for you in chat from Tom. And he would like to know if you do individual readings. I guess I do. Um, if you can look me up under my name, Jennifer Malik, on Facebook. We could talk. I do tarot readings. I do oracle readings. I use pendulums. And for people that are close to me up in person, I do palm readings as well. That's pretty neat. I had a palm reading at one point. It was very surprising. That's what I love about palm readings. They're so detailed that people don't realize it until they're having one. And it's like, wow. Yes. (laughs) I was one of those wow people because I was not entirely convinced that was a thing. (laughs) Turns out, yes, it is. I was fascinated. But, Kevin, I would like to know what brought you into this because you're not just one thing or another either. You are, you're one of the most, you both are two of the most well-read people I know relevant to the topics that we research. You're into conspiracy analysis. You're into ufology. That MUFON test is not easy. And yet you passed it just gangbusters. So how did you get involved with A, the conspiracy, B, ufology, and C, the paranormal overall that led you into the Northern Wisconsin Paranormal Society Limited? Well, I think the the unknown and unexplained in general is where it all stems from. And that would be my interest in it was peaked early on. My mother and father had an amazing library at the house growing up. Uh, 
filled with books that you know uh, they're they're both three uh, free thinkers you know think outside of the box when needed that kind of thing um, and so it was an open topic it, it wasn't taboo like it was for many people so and then of course growing up I think um, most people will have at least one experience in their life that can't explain something you know I've at had least. a yeah, so I've had a, a few different experiences that uh, that really um, made me come to terms with the fact that this stuff is real and it does happen. And obviously it happens. Millions of people uh, wouldn't be interested in it, uh, billions even for that matter. You know, spirituality uh, – the idea that we're spiritual beings having a human existence instead of human beings having a, a spiritual experience yes. or something. Uh, so what happened, I had uh, I had seen, I had uh, UFO experiences, seen uh, UFOs, mm -hmm. three, what I call three uh, major UFO sightings. Um, where they were close enough, and it was uh, it was in a, it, it was something, right? So, and they're all separate and apart from each other. Different. It wasn't like the same craft all three times or anything. Uh, really, you had different craft each time. Yeah, or a different. We'll, we'll call um, unidentified uh, f uh, aerial phenomenon. But the different like, styles with, of craft. Yes. Yes. That's cool. Well, one was certainly nuts and bolts. It was a, a triangle, the TR-3B, mm -hmm. uh, if you will. Uh, and one was just a, a orange, fuzzy, oval object that was flying very fast, shooting back and forth across the sky like it was gritting something or mapping something out or looking for something. That's interesting. The third thing I saw was, like, if I were to take a, a super large piece of glass and hold it up to the sky and look at it, that's what it looked like. I could see uh, the, there was – I remember looking up at the sky while I was fishing, and just for, like, a minute where I was compared to the daylight and, I, I don't know, it must have been all the right angles and the right everything, for me to see this perfect square in the sky, it was like – the outline of something invisible and something extremely large. Like I could not get it all in a picture if I wanted to. I would have to take pictures of the corners. I mean, that's how big this was. And it was clear to me this was not a natural phenomenon, but I was witnessing something that I couldn't explain, you know. Um, anyway, so I had these experiences, and I'm like, okay, UFOs are real. I and, agree with that. Yeah. By this time, I had already started – collecting my own books. In fact, my mom had bought me an encyclopedia uh, set on the unknown and unexplained. It had 25 books. Each book had a different topic. You know, one was uh, lake monsters and one was ghosts and one UFOs and Stonehenge and on and on and on. So, um, you know, so, so to me, like, this is real. And then uh, I had uh, me and a buddy of mine we're riding down a road one day and we had this is we had a sasquatch cross the road in front of us and in front of you yes oh wow this is this is a catalyst for starting the society because up until that point the only thing i had seen is ufo the, as far as the rest of it ghosts and bigfoot and anything else i didn't know if it was real or not Unless you have an experience with it, there's always going to be that 0.1% doubt, right, if nothing else. So, yeah, we, it was daytime. We were both sober. Uh, it happened to be the hottest day of the year. And we came around a corner on a county road going really fast. And this figure crossed the highway, came up on the shoulder, crossed the highway, and went back. And uh, when we first seen it, I, I nudged my buddy because he was driving. I'm like, hey, look, it's Bigfoot because it looked like a – for real. Because it looked like a tall, hunched-over old man carrying two five-gallon buckets, like the silhouette. 
and right. and they were swinging from side to side like it was striding like it was you know it crossed the highway in like four or five steps right oh wow I mean, it was striding and it turned out them pickle buckets were its forearms which go all the all the way almost to the ground i mean it was holy wow because what happened was as it crossed and i'm i'm like hey it's bigfoot and you know um so where it crossed and it went back into the woods, my buddy stopped the car. I didn't have to tell him to stop the car. He just stopped the car. And he looks in the woods. He looks at me. He goes, should we go in there after it? I'm like, are you crazy? You see how big it is? It will kill <laughs> us. You know? Easily. It was, yeah, it was uh, so hot that day. I know I had set a record that day as far as heat index or or just hot heat. Uh when it happened to us, it was about 10.30 on a Saturday morning. At that point, we had, you know, the sunroof open, the windows down, we're in Bermuda shorts, uh, no shirts. It was hot. And, uh, you know, as it crossed the highway, you realize that it wasn't an old man carrying two five-gallon buckets, but it was actually a Bigfoot. And when we stopped the car, there was nothing. You couldn't see and, and here's the thing. Had it been a man with buckets, we would have seen him fumbling through the brush. Okay? Absolutely, there's so much yeah. undergrowth by, that comes up to the highway like that. And it was also on a, a, a climb. So he would have had to go over the, the incline before he would have been out of sight. And yet there was nothing. It's almost like he either walked into thin air or he spread eagle and went on the ground. All fours, so we couldn't see him. It was one or the other, because he was gone by the time we stopped the car. There was no driveway. There was no nothing, nothing man-made, and there was no reason for anybody to be crossing the road five-gallon buckets or anything. I mean, it wasn't five-gallon buckets. Like I said, it's you're talking forearms. Uh, just the most amazing thing. And paneling brown. Uh, the same color as, like, Chewbacca, basically. You know, without all the guns and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> The belts, yeah. That is but, so cool. So I at think, that point, I'm sorry. What did um, you do? Well, I wanted to join a society at that point because I'm like, oh, you got to be kidding me. So this is real too. And I've seen this now. They're in our woods here. Like I can investigate this. I got to join a society. Surely I, I could be asked to someone by now. And so I went to join a society that investigated the paranormal. And I want to investigate all of it, not just some of it. Exactly. Because, um, and as the years go by, I can tell you, when you step back and you look at the bigger picture, it's all interconnected anyways. Yes, it is. So, I agree. So, uh, and there was, there were no teams, paranormal teams, like we see today. This is, uh, so I started one. And at the time, we were called the Northwoods Paranormal Society. Uh, three years into it, we learned that there was another one called the Northwoods Paranormal Society, and they were older than us. So... We changed the name to Northern Wisconsin Paranormal Society. And fortunately for us, the acronym stayed the same. So we didn't have to change everything all over the cameras and everything I wrote NWPS on. But uh, <laughs> that anyway. That's a good thing. Yeah. But yeah, so we're it's the little in little things. It really is, right? Yeah. I agree. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, because we're in the northern third of Wisconsin. We're up north. And so it's on a, there's, there's no major metropolitan areas up here. It's boonies, you know, um, and like I said, there was uh, even now. Uh, there's there's a couple teams, but there's there's really not that many teams overall in Northern Wisconsin. I mean, I, I think we're. I know, uh, uh, like, well, Appleton's got a, a, a team, and and Chippewa Valley's got a team. So there, there's uh, – and there's, you know, the Upper Peninsula has got a couple teams. So there are teams, you know, but when when I was looking for one, there was not. And there was MUFON, but they were just UFOs. Yes. There was there was BFRO, but I wasn't aware of them at that time. And they were just Bigfoot anyhow. Which is a that research uh, organization. Yes. And on top of it, they don't acknowledge paranormal. And to me, there's every possibility that – this Bigfoot phenomenon may have something supernatural going on because there's just too many unanswered questions. Well, there's too many unanswered questions. There's too many places that these things 
are seen and just poof are gone. Right. There's too many instances of light flashes or anomalies happening as they go. It's just amazing to me. But you know what? We are just about up on our second break of the evening. So we will be back right after this with our guests. Thank you for being here. You are listening to WBHM, digital broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk only on Paranormal Experience Radio. Broadcasting live, live, live out of Birmingham, Alabama. for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 45 minutes after the hour. Welcome back to Fate Mag Radio here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I'm Kat Hobson, your host, with my guests, Jennifer and Kevin Malik. We have been having a fantastic time. These are anomalous topics that they experience. They're Jennifer, with her work, comes across religious situations quite often. We were just talking about how, in this short period of time, y'all are probably blown away. That's a good thing, because you know what? We're going to blow you away a little bit more. Kevin, I had to stop you, and I apologize for that. Please do continue with your thought process. We were discussing your experience and the fact that things, you went and started your own... Well, you were looking for a society to join. Right. Yeah. So, um, and there wasn't one. And, uh, so I, we started, I started a society, me and a buddy of mine who's not with it anymore. Uh, my buddy, Chad, it was just him and me at first. And then as time went on, more people started getting involved. And after the first four years, we went, we got a Facebook page and we went public. Um, I, I didn't want to go public before we knew what we were doing. Like I wanted to have experience. I wanted to have equipment. I just didn't want to like start a team and just go out there right away and start advertising, not knowing what was, not knowing anything. Like, well, you had a strong knowledge base once you went public too. Right. As far as, well, with the paranormal, yeah. As, um, with, with the, the history and, and that kind of stuff pretty good with but there are things about investigating that you just learn over time that experience will teach you and there's no other way to get it and i recognize that so that's why um for the the first four years we didn't advertise and then when uh joined facebook so i can do the the paranormal society and that's how i met jennifer she was at uh csi paranormal in florida 
and we met on Facebook. Uh, we were working on a case, and we had never used a psychic before. And I had become aware that Jennifer had remote viewing abilities. So uh, we called her from the location we were investigating one night. She did a remote view, and it was brilliant. And everybody was impressed. Jennifer got along with everybody. We had a young uh, adult who had joined the team who had also abilities. And I, I realized that she needed a mentor, you yes. know. So um, at that point, uh, Jennifer started to become involved with the society, even from a distance. Halfway through the case, and after many months, of course, me and Jennifer talking a lot, getting closer and closer, and I invited her to come up here to Wisconsin and visit for a couple of weeks and uh, work the case with us, finish, you know, see the case through. And, uh, yeah, and so now, you know, uh, she moved up here. And we got married eventually. And, yeah, I, I don't know too many ufologists who marry demonologists, but uh, <laughs> in our case, it happened. Not me. And, yeah, and to tell people during break, I'm like, you realize within the first 20 minutes, like, we got attacked by two demons, <laughs> three UFOs, and a Bigfoot. <laughs> like, you're not going to believe it, but this is true stuff. I mean, this It is true all, stuff. I mean, it's yeah. extreme, but it is. Right. And, and because of what y'all do, Y'all are placed in a position where you do come across things. And I'm going to tell you that I think y'all are so brave and strong to live where y'all do. But because of, because of the cold, but because of the environment, I think that it is a perfect location to just study, I mean, for other beings to study and research, do flora, fauna kind of things. You know, I, right. I am not surprised that these things happen there. And Bigfoot has a coat, so I'm sure he's, you know, toasty. But well, we I have will dog. stay here and do my research. Yeah. Wisconsin's got dogs. Right? Yeah, we also have dogmen up here. I know. I think that's the most fascinating thing because when you were talking, do you mind if I ask a question right quick? You, yeah, <laughs> interrupt your thought process. But when we were talking earlier and you were talking about the various anomalies coming together, you know, being part of the same mold as it were, I have spoken with several people who do dogman research. They're commuted with telepathically by the creatures that they are seeking and researching. Right. To the to the point of there were four men fully armed standing outside their vehicle when one came by and they all without hesitation knew that if one of them raised a weapon, it was going to be bad for everyone. I mean, they were basically, you know, mind transferred that. So do you feel that that telepathic communication is the same with the investigations that you have had, did you come across something that would make you believe that? Well, I think that certainly one of the theories in paracryptozoology is the mind speak. Bigfoot, dog men, some various cryptids, not all cryptids, but some cryptids are, uh, uh, people have claimed to to be part of that. Or, or, or to experience that, I should say. Okay. And so I believe, like I said before, the I, I to me, the supernatural in the in the whole cryptid thing is a it's possible. So I won't rule it out. Paracryptozoology to me is as uh, legit as regular cryptozoology. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because you have two sides of the fence. One side doesn't acknowledge paranormal and the other side does. And I'm glad to see the field of paracryptozoology growing as it has. Um, because there was a time 
when if you brought up that someone had seen lights during a Bigfoot uh, sighting on a forum, a Bigfoot forum, you would get destroyed by Pete comments and everyone would attack you for even daring to bring up anything paranormal. Yes. Even though it's happening, people are experiencing this and that. And, and, but, uh, so the need for a field where people can discuss these, uh, theories openly was needed and it it has grown into such. Uh, we just had David Kielman on, who's a parasociologist who also studies the dogman phenomenon. And he's considered one of the, uh, the premier um, uh, researchers in that field. And uh, if you talk to him, he also and, – and, he, and he's talked to many more dogman man witnesses than we have because he specializes in that. Yeah. And uh, telepathy is, is going on in some of these reports, mind speak. So – yeah, I do. I think it's, you know, um, and and you see that with ufology and the, the alien phenomenon where some people, um, they will communicate with, with alien beings and there is no speaking going on. Yes. Of course, we see that in parapsychology uh, with PSI and, and ESP and, and, you know, the psychic stuff. So it's, it's in all fields. I mean, it's there. I, I, I don't think that, um, yeah, I... I does that answer your question? It does. Awesome. Thank you. Yes. But, um, yeah, so, you know, the Northwoods, I, you know, I think you can go in the middle. In fact, I know this. This is, I know this because we've experienced this. You can go in the middle of nowhere and come across weird activity. And it's been documented all over the earth in various places. It's not only in urban areas. Uh, where uh, people have strange or high strangeness. That happens in the middle of nowhere too. Um, interesting stuff. So yeah, we cover eight categories of the unknown and unexplained. And I think anything, any topic that you mention within the eight categories, you can place into one of those eight categories, which is ghosts and haunted places, cryptids and monsters, aliens and UFOs, conspiracies, crimes, and corruption, metaphysics, theology, mythology, and uh, forbidden archaeology. And I was not counting. I think I named them all. Did I miss any? Demonology. Oh, theology, mythology. I named seven? Yes. Which one am I missing here? Metaphysics, theology, conspiracies, ghosts, folklore, and urban legends. There you go. There we go. There we go. I See, couldn't I, find it either. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> any any weird anomalous what story or or claim or whatever can be you can probably put into one of those eight categories. Uh, so yeah, and like I said, there's you know it's interesting how the these cat and they overlap. You know, you're talking about conspiracies. Aliens and UFOs and conspiracies are heavy overlapping because the government's involved. Yes. And the government is blamed for all kinds of conspiracies, most of which are true, in my opinion. Um, and, uh, of course, the alien and UFOs, is you get the whole cover-up of different events that have happened. Um, which is my so frustrating. Right. It's like they're just assuming we're idiots. My introduction into conspiracies was actually uh, David Icke. Mm-hmm. As a teenager, uh, I'm almost 50 now. When I, I was a, uh, 16, 17, we had a, a video store in town. And the guy who owned the video store, of course, he had all the movies out in front. But in the back, like behind like the register... There was this little rack he had, and then were the conspiracy ones. And I tell you, even by today's standards, he had some really good documentaries in his little collection. And of course, I, I could see the collection. You know, when I go up to the counter, and you know, he had like uh, uh, all kinds of stuff. He had, of course, like DVIKE stuff when Dave like he was younger. He had. 
uh, I'm having brain farts here. <laughs> um, I want to say, uh, well, anyways, yeah, so he had all these different ones, pretty amazing stuff. Um, and on Bigfoot, on moon anomalies, right? Um, and that's, that's why I'm having the brain fart. Gary, uh, and I can't even, anyways, yeah, so, uh, yeah, David Icke. So I still have the video I own after I saw a couple of those. Then I um, started getting my own, and I still have them all, the the videotapes, uh, him going through the, the reptilian bloodlines. and That's fascinating. We actually, with my non-paranormal husband, were just having a conversation about that yesterday. Yeah, you know, um, let's see what time. We have got about a minute and 45. So, and yeah, so um, I thought these things are totally fascinating. And it really, like, until I had watched, I think it was like, uh, uh, until I had watched the Ike videos, I wasn't aware of the bloodlines. I wasn't aware of the, the reptilian stuff. And... Once I became aware of that, then there's this whole other area of the shape-shifting. Um, we see that with the werewolves, the skinwalkers, reptilians. There's always some occult something going on, it seems, when shape-shifting is taking place. And it happens during certain rituals where their vibration is changing. Something's yeah. happening. And for periods of time, they appear to be other than human and and some people speculate is it physical is it just a vibrational thing either way that's what they're appearing as and um that's you know that's some pretty heavy duty paranormal stuff too you know well it uh, is and that gets into a whole different realm of evidence and is this just a a video glitch is because it looks almost like a heat shimmer in the videos that I have seen, is if something is happening behind that shimmer. And we need to get further into this when we get back from our top of the hour break. And for everyone listening, we will be back. This is going to be a little little news break. And hopefully, you know, maybe we will find a little good news today. I know it's a stretch. But here's hoping, right? Gotta keep faith. This message comes from NPR sponsor, Old Edwards Inn and Spa in downtown Highlands, North Carolina, a European-style luxury mountain resort. The romantic mountain escape package includes two nights with spa credits and dinner. More information at oldedwardsinn.com. Live from NPR News in Washington, I'm Barbara Klein. In Cedar Rapids, Iowa this hour, the biggest gathering of 2020 Democratic presidential hopefuls is getting underway. Nineteen candidates are preparing to speak at the state's Democratic Party Hall of Fame dinner. The Iowa caucuses, the nation's first nominating contest, aren't until February, but NPR Scott Detrow says Democratic activists are eager to hear what the candidates have to say. Groups of supporters for several different campaigns are out here in force on the street in front of the hotel in Cedar Rapids where all the candidates will be speaking. There's a Beto O'Rourke crowd, an Amy Klobuchar crowd, Elizabeth Warren, Kamala Harris, Cory Booker. Every candidate is going to give a five-minute speech today, 19 candidates in all making their case to Iowans. One of the candidates, former Vice President Joe Biden, is not in Cedar Rapids. Mexican President Andres Manuel López Obrador is vowing to fill, fulfill the commitments of the deal reached with the U.S. Friday that averts President Trump's tariffs. 6,000 Mexican National Guard are due to be deployed to Mexico's border with Guatemala tomorrow. In the meantime, James Frederick is at the river at the Ciudad Hidalgo border crossing and says life there is going on as normal. 
these little rafts are crossing as they always have. So, you know, that includes little goods they're crossing between the two countries, commuters, people just going for the day into Mexico or Guatemala. But I've also seen several groups of migrants cross today. So uh, a little bit earlier, there were a couple of soldiers walking around doing a little loop here. But other than that, there is uh, absolutely no enforcement of this border, as Mexico says it's going to do. Reporter James Frederick, who says elsewhere in the area, migration authorities, police and soldiers are setting up checkpoints and checking vans and buses for undocumented migrants. Thousands of Venezuelans are streaming into Colombia to buy food and medicine now that a key border post between the two nations is back open. John Otis reports the Venezuelan government closed border bridges in February. Amid a deep economic crisis, Venezuelans depend on Colombian border towns to buy everything from milk to antibiotics. But in February, Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro closed the busiest border near the Colombian city of Cucuta. He claimed that an opposition plan to use the area to move humanitarian aid into Venezuela was a pretext for a U.S.-backed invasion. That prompted some Venezuelans to cross on dangerous footpaths controlled by drug traffickers. Giving no explanation, Maduro has reopened the border at Cucuta for pedestrians, though it remains closed for vehicles. For NPR News, I'm John Otis in Bogota, Colombia. This is NPR. American Airlines is extending cancellations of about 115 daily flights until September 3rd, as Boeing 737 MAX aircraft remain grounded following two deadly crashes. Boeing has yet to submit a software upgrade and training changes in order to get recertification to the FAA. The nation's largest airline says it's making the move to allow customers to more reliably plan their travel. More than a week after the mass shootings in Virginia Beach, family and friends are still paying their respects to some of the 12 people who were killed. One of the victims is being buried at this hour following a memorial service earlier. Ian Stewart of member station WCVE reports. 54-year-old Christopher Rapp had a long career in public works as an engineer throughout Virginia. However, he had only been working at the Virginia Municipal Center for 11 months before he was killed in the shooting. Former co-worker Brenda Schulte remembered his work ethic. To me, he's kind of like the, the perfect public servant, uh, the stereotype of one, you know, someone who just wants to help people. City offices at the complex remain open except where the shooting took place. That building is closed so investigators can piece together exactly what happened. For NPR News, I'm Ian Stewart in Richmond, Virginia. Game 6 in hockey Stanley Cup best of 7 final is tonight. The St. Louis Blues lead the Boston Bruins 3 games to 2. I'm Barbara Klein, NPR News. Welcome back to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 5 minutes after the hour. Welcome back to Fate Mag Radio here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I am your host, Kat Hobson, and I'm so glad you're here because we are having a fascinating conversation. My guests tonight are Jennifer and Kevin Malick. They are the Northern Wisconsin Paranormal Society Limited, a 501c3 corporation, and they are astounding researchers. Jennifer is a psychic demonologist, religious demonologist, psychic medium, and she is a remote viewer who has been involved in bringing children home. Kevin is all things paranormal. Kevin is an anomalous researcher in conspiracy. Oh, good heavens. Monsters, cryptids. He is the host with Jennifer of Paraversal Universe Radio here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. He is Paraversal Universe Paratunes, and if you haven't checked out that page, you're going to love it. Also, Ultimate Conspiracies, the Paralogian Report, which is on Paraversal Universe Radio a couple of times a month. I believe they're going a little bit more active with that as well. And I am happy to say that I am a contributing correspondent with that show. I, I consider that a very high honor, and I love doing it. Learn new stuff every time. 
So welcome back, Jennifer and Kevin. Hello. Hello. Thanks for having us on. Yes, thank you. Well, I'm loving it. And I had a question relevant to what we were discussing. And if y'all could just hear these breaks, y'all would... <laughs> I think somebody should record breaks at some point, but I'm not going to. <laughs> <laughs> some of the best conversation happens during breaks, in between breaks when the host and guests are talking, because we have it with Periversal Universe, too. Yes, we do. Absolutely. Um, I think I, I think we're five years, I'm guessing an average of 40 episodes a year. To do easy math, maybe 50. Well, there's 52 weeks in a year, so yeah, 40. We take a month and a half off. Mm-hmm. So, Four times five, that's uh, 200 episodes. Yeah, so we, I thought it was more than that. Just 200? Hmm, oh, what well. was your five year anniversary? Uh, it, technically, it was in, I want to say, November of 2013. And my five that's year is coming up this November. Okay. So we have all been at this for quite some time, and it's pretty amazing because that's a long time in this business. Yeah, it is. Podcasts usually don't last that long. Mm -mm. They usually do a year or two, and they realize that it's more work than they thought. Yeah, <laughs> that's usually the big one, or or whatever. Um, you know, just, just different re different things come up, and and they, and you know, they they give it a rest. Sometimes yes. they'll come back to it in a couple of years and, and do another run and then put it down for a while. Um, but, yeah, we've been pretty consistent with that. And it's, it's a pleasure to do. Well, and, I'm go going ahead. to interrupt you because I would like to give a shout out. You know, we were speaking about the longevity of most podcasts. I want to give a shout out to Jim Mallard of the Mallard Report, oh, who yeah. just celebrated his seventh year anniversary. The Mallard Report is on Tuesday nights at www.mallard.com. And if you have not listened to that, you are missing out. It's awesome. So just wanted to make sure that got out there. I meant to do it before we started. So, Yeah, yeah we, uh, we started the like page for Paraversal Universe on November. Our okay. first show aired in January. Um, on on PKRN, mm -hmm. which you were at, and that's I how was. we, yes, our both our shows started on the same network. Mm -hmm. We did, and, and then we left PK. Both of us left PKRN to work on various networks to eventually come back to this network and work together again. And I'm so glad we do. Yes, yeah, it's I nice, am too. It's nice to be working with people who are professional and enjoy their topics and. You know that if they're doing a show, then the the homework's been done, the guests are going to be credible, and the information you're going to be gathering from those interviews, you can pretty much take to the bank and include it with your work to go back and review. I love that yeah. about your show. Well, we started doing it um, so we can it, it, have the opportunity once a week to pick the minds of the most brilliant people in the paranormal fields. Absolutely. And it was, you know, and, and that goes for anyone in the society. If they wanted to, uh, you know, um, ask anybody anything or, or have us have anyone on, that kind of thing. And, you know, it, it gives you a reason to call really smart people and, and basically say, hey, can we have a conversation for a couple hours, you know, um, and, of course, having the platform to do it, and they were glad for it because it's PR for them. Yes. And Sells books. Yeah. So now uh, we've made so many friends over the last five years. Um, I think that's the best part. Yeah. You know, as, as bad as uh, uh, face friends can be, or, you know, I mean, face broke. I do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, today with the, the censorship and, and all the issues with that, uh, it still brought so many people together. Even though it was the greatest spy tool ever created, it still brought so many people together. Um, right. Oh, and you know, there's something else I wanted to say too before I forget. 
Uh, just had us an honor to be on Fate Magazine Radio. Yes, it is. Uh, Fate Magazine has been out since the late 40s. and 1948, yes. Yeah. Wow. wow. Right? Uh-huh. Wow. I mean, it's so amazing. And for the for the paranormal world, that's a, a staple. Yeah. So what an honor. Is. Thank you. You know what? I am I'm very honored to be the host of this show. To be the voice of Fate Magazine is a tremendous honor. And I am appreciative every day. When I heard that you became the host of Fate Magazine, I thought it, 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 you were the perfect person for that. Yeah. Because you are well versed. You're well versed in all, all them all them categories I named, all eight of them. You know a thing or two about all eight of those categories, <laughs> or three, or four, or five. So yeah, um, they they won't just offer that to anybody. And yeah. um, very very awesome. Thank you. I well. love it. <laughs> <laughs> I do love it. I think this is the best gig going. As the the planes fly over. Yes. No, I am not being dive bombed because of the conversation topic. Right. But you know, I I am I really am apolitical. As long as people are doing their job and doing it well and getting things done, I have, I was a political science major in college. I find it fascinating. But for the things that are happening now, you know, they're, they're trying to give themselves a raise again and they're not doing diddly squat. There's been none of the people's business done in the House of Representatives for almost, well, definitely for this year, but. For two years, and they I want can, to raise. I know. I cannot believe they have the audacity and gall to even do that, I considering, know. like, the faith in politics is at an all-time low. Nobody trusts politicians. The sad thing is, so many people are are, and, and they use the slave to the grind. It's one of their greatest weapons against humanity, and yes. that is. Because everyone needs to focus on just paying the bills and staying alive and being comfortable. And when we all should have free electricity, we, you know, um, I don't know. Okay, to me, uh, like I personally believe that uh, we could be a race without a monetary system. And I know that there are people that argue that. And I get that. It's the, the idea of it is so foreign to us, especially after being conditioned into capitalism in a monetary system. But uh, either way, there's got to be uh, some alternative or, or uh, again, like I think all, every house should have free electricity. There are so many different ways we can get electricity. I mean, we have we should have cars that run on water. We have the technology to do it. They actually do have the technology for that. Yeah. And just, it's ridiculous. They've cured cancer. They, I mean, they got all kinds of stuff. That they that would help people. Okay, um, we're we're going uh, light years ahead in certain fields, learning new stuff all the time, and yes. then other fields are just stagnant. Like we're driving these gas guzzling cars that we were driving a hundred years ago, or was it hundred? Yeah, a hundred years yes, ago. Yes, a hundred years. So it's like, well, we didn't go very far with that, did we? Yeah, you know. Actually, we have gone very far with that, but that technology is not allowed to be, see the light of day. That's the thing. It's That's like, the... you know, what if the government had backed Tesla instead of Edison? Mm. Yeah. Right. Everyone would have. That's another way. They yeah. Everybody would have free energy. And he way. knew it. And yeah. it, and kind of, uh, we did a show on that recently. Yes, you and, did. I and... enjoyed that show very much. Thank you. And it. Uh, it was, know, a Robert, shame. Robert. It, was a, it was a shame what they did to him. I agree. Yes. It was just, yeah, it breaks my heart every time oh. I hear about it or I'm reminded of it. We have to take a break. So, Kevin, we were discussing some of the things relevant to Tesla and free energy, and which really should not be controversial, except for the fact that we don't have them and why. Right. So, well, it's just the idea <laughs> that they're going to charge us for it. And then uh, it, it goes back to the slave to the grind thing, which is and, – and, and that's designed to keep people preoccupied 
from being more involved in the community and in the world around them just by keeping them busy with with their you know uh and, and yeah you know we all gotta be productive in life i'm not saying we should all sit around and do nothing don't get me wrong but um at the same time there are uh there are a lot of people out there who have found themselves in employment situations they're not happy with and um they're making basically someone else a lot of money and not themselves and um you have that in a large way across the board and it's just another one of the little things in society that we just assume is but it doesn't I know. Need- everybody just accepts that as fact it's you know even the daily grind i mean people name coffee shops that because it's such a part of society it yeah. doesn't have to be a grind the rat race the daily grind um like you know uh uh all of that, you know. The double mortgage. I mean, mortgages and cars. It's just terrible. And, you know, Wendy in chat said, yep, the old bait and switch. Look over here while we're behind your back doing truly horrific things. And yeah, that's been, been the yeah. case. You know, who pays $2,000 for a hammer besides our military? Being in theology. Man makes plans and God laughs. Absolutely he does. And with that, we are just about to go to our final break. I am, I'm fascinated by this because I, I find the topic, well, the subject matter, not just the topic, but everything relevant to this fascinates me. I sit back and I watch and I'm just kind of like, well, look at that. So we will be back after this with our guests for the final segment. So y'all come on back. You are listening to WBHM, digital broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk only on Paranormal Experience Radio, broadcasting live, live, live out of Birmingham, Alabama. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 45 minutes after the hour. Welcome back to the final segment of Fate Mag Radio. Thank you so much for being here. You know, I never, ever have conspiracy theory shows because they're, they're controversial I find them interesting because I'm a poli-sci major. This is stuff that to me is entertainment and fascinating. I know not everybody feels that way. That's why we have the disclaimer at the beginning of the show that says that the opinions voiced here are not those of the network or necessarily the station or the show host. But 
I am having a great time. But I think now, if you and Jennifer don't mind, Kevin, I want people to learn more about you. I want, to, I want you to educate them somewhat about your society and how you came to be a 501c3 and what y'all have as like a mission statement, what you plan to accomplish with your society. Okay, uh, and I'm, I'm glad to talk about this because this is at the heart of what we do. Uh, the, out of all the stuff we cover and the different things that come to us, the majority of the stuff is either my house is haunted or I'm haunted. And because of uh, various reasons, we tend to uh, because we've been around for a while, because we have some experience with this, because we have uh, members in our society that are uh, academically trained to deal with this kind of stuff, we uh, a lot of the the we'll have other paranormal teams will will come to us if they're having trouble or on the case that they feel is is too dark um, because Jennifer's a demonologist. Stuff comes in. Uh, so over time, we've gone from um, our cases being you would call your average paranormal case to a lot, a lot of the stuff we deal with. You know, families are traumatized. People are traumatized. Individuals are. They're having bad experiences. Uh, they want it to stop. It's affecting their marriage, their family, their relationships. Um, and then, you know, of course, we got to figure out what exactly is going on and it's not all the time paranormal so uh but that's at i mean for most of the stuff that we deal with those are the kind of situations we're dealing with the 501c3 was we chose to do that because it's more reputable also because uh we had grown to a point where it was a, a a good idea just to be as organized as possible. And the other reason is because we can, uh, there are certain benefits to being a 501c3. Um, and we were putting enough, so much time and energy into it that if for us to continue to be able to do it without financially having our Heinskis handed to us. Uh, yes. It, it was, it was important that we do that. And so we did. And so now we can write off things if we, you know, uh, money that's invested into the society, into the society, we can write off, uh, which is a big help. And, and we do accept donations. We never bill anybody for our services ever. Um, but people are free to donate, you know, to our society, which helps us. And then we can take that money and uh, use it to help more families so, uh, yeah, so we've been a 501c3 for, I want to say, three years now, and that's going good. In fact, I'm just about to send in our yearly audit this month, and you do a, um, a yearly uh, – there's paperwork. There's a lot of paperwork, believe me. <laughs> there is but a lot of paperwork with a 501c3. If you don't, it's huge. It is, but if you don't want to charge people, but at the same time – you realize you're putting a lot of money into it and, and it's causing issue. That's a way you can deal with it, you know? And another thing I want to plug quick is that our book will be out. Yes. Paraversal universe, decade of diligence, uh, cases and experiences from Jennifer and myself, the NWPS, uh, that in fact, um, that should be sent off this week to the publisher. So uh, there are two little tiny things. We wanted to add uh, uh, a, little, a couple paragraphs about Jennifer's mentor who just passed away uh, because he was an influence, a positive influence on uh, Jennifer and the society and us and, and even myself. We, um, uh, Ken Deal was an excellent demonologist and a, a, a very uh he was a good man 
He's a good man. warrior of God. A yeah, warrior of God. And he will be missed. May he rest in peace. So we wanted to add a little blurb about that because that's important. That is important. You know, I was not blessed to know him, but I sure do know an awful lot of people who held him in such esteem because of his goodness and kindness. And, we, and his just his willingness to help others. Yes, and he died at a young age. I he mean, did die at a young age. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, he uh, he is eight years older than me. So, um, but yeah, I mean, that's uh, and it and and it was one of the things that uh, you know. It wasn't one of them things that you really seen coming. Mm -hmm. No, it was totally. It, it was totally unexpected. Nobody expected yes. it. Caught everybody off guard. Yeah, I'll, you know. Um, and then, yeah, so, and then this week we addressed the, the cover of the book. So then there's a couple things we got to do. Otherwise, the letters, uh, the initiate letter that goes out to the, the guy who's going to format our book. And the the book itself goes out this week. So yay. So hopefully it will be ready mm -hmm. by our next Paracon that we're attending, which is in Des Moines, Iowa, this July. If you live in the Iowa area in Des Moines in July and you're into the paranormal, please come out. It will be at the Ferrar Haunted School, which is about 20 miles outside of the, the uh, Des Moines mm -hmm. metro area. And uh, there will be a lot of wonderful speakers there. And vendors. And vendors. So, uh, including, uh, Jennifer, myself, and also Jean Breida, who was one of the correspondents on the Paralogian Report, which will be every other week, starting in September. Twice a month, we'll do the Paralogian Report, and twice a month, we will do Paraversal Universe interviews. Uh, so, uh, we're looking forward to that. I love that. It's, it's the... The every time a paralogian report comes out, it seems that, that uh, the numbers are good. Uh, you know, the numbers are real good with that. So we're getting a lot of support with that. Um, I think it's because the panel is so diverse and well-rounded, and because we're bringing news topics that I mean, uh, you know, topics that are important not just to pop culture but also to the academic world. You yes. know, that's. That's uh, a good thing. Well, you so know, I find a lot of my topics in mainstream, in mainstream media mm -hmm. that are, is a, <laughs> I'm always surprised by how many I find on anomalous topics that are just right out there. I had mm -hmm. that conversation with somebody the other day that who would, who would ever expect a discussion of ufology to be in you know the Washington Post or New York Times it's just fascinating the, I tell the you, times are changing every college it seems not everyone but many most colleges at some point in their college career have invested money time and energy and resources into experiments which may seem anomalous or supernatural, paranormal, fortean, esoteric, weird, uh, bizarre. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's you're, again, uh, we're, we're science into the unknown and unexplained is what defines what is science fiction and science fact, what is metaphysics and what is physics, mm -hmm. uh, or what we would define as such. I mean, it's, it's, it's all just, you know, it is, but... You know, humans got to label stuff and, and define things. <laughs> we live based on labels, right? It's just our genetic makeup, apparently, which is odd. I, yeah. I would prefer to think that's a societal training thing as opposed to genetic. But I've, it's universal. It's tough to make that call. And then we have the Resource Center here in Rylander. Uh, it's the headquarters for society. We have our library here. Uh over you have an a thousand. astounding library. Thank you. We're very fortunate. Um, it's an awesome library, and it's it's all the books are on the unknown and unexplained. Um, so, uh, and we have our, our meetings here. Our we our team meets once a week. We go over cases, and of course, we'll we'll go to notable haunted places sometimes for research or <clears throat> training purposes. 
or just appreciate the history of a place. Um, you know, we uh, we were on the news earlier this week, so we'll do stuff like that. Oh, we'll yes. Skip. Tell people about that. We've got just about four minutes total, but that was amazing. Would yeah, you NBC. share that? Well, it was just NBC. Um, just NBC. You're so <laughs> modest. <laughs> Came out and uh, uh, spent a day with us. Yeah, spent a few hours with us. Going over, and it's funny how you spend hours with some, you know, and it's all whittled down into five minutes. You know, amazing, isn't it? And, yeah. So, and a lot of that five minutes is ex- like, like either leading up to the scenes that they show or afterwards. So it's really like about three minutes of what you're doing and and stuff. So. I mean, I need during the interview. Of course, we named all our members, and and because you know it's a society thing. It's not just it us. It's just, there's right now 20 members in the society. Uh, we cover the top third of Wisconsin, and we you know after 10 years, we've been fortunate enough that we've grown well. You know, um, so but yeah, all that got cut out. A lot of stuff got cut out, but it's still good exposure. Mm-hmm. It is, and, and, and let every, people know you're there to help. Yeah, every couple of years um, we'll be approached, you know, by...